hello. Thank you for watching this episode of Demystifying Columnar Databases. I am your host, June Tong. I'm a data warehousing consultant working with CalPont Corporation, the makers of InfiniDB. Before I started working with CalPont, I spent several years doing data warehousing with conventional row-oriented databases, and before that, working in OLTP environments. So I wanted to create this presentation in order to make columnar databases more accessible and less mysterious to people who have a background in conventional row-oriented relational databases. My goal for this presentation is to answer the following questions, which I thought you might have, because they're the questions I had when I first started hearing about columnar databases. What is a columnar database? Why is it better than a row-oriented database? When is it not better? What do I need to know to use it? And how will I need to change my application code? But first, a word from our sponsors. Who is CalPont, anyway? CalPont is a privately held company headquartered in Frisco, Texas. But in truly distributed fashion, we have sales and marketing staff in various locations around the country, including the San Francisco Bay Area, where I am lo located, Portland, Oregon, Denver, Colorado, and Boston, Massachusetts. Our mission is to provide a scalable data platform that enables analytic business decisions as timely as customers and markets dictate. InfiniDB is CalPont's columnar massively parallel MySQL database engine, which is expressly designed for analytical applications. InfiniDB Community is our free open source edition which runs on a single server. And InfiniDB Enterprise is the enterprise product which can run in an MPP environment. Version 2.2 supports a shared disk configuration, and version 3.0, which was just released in April, adds a shared nothing option to this. In order to understand the differences you get with the columnar database, let's first review how traditional databases work. In a row-oriented database, the rows are stored sequentially, with one row immediately following another. All the columns of a single row are stored together on the same page, assuming the row size is smaller than the page size. This provides great performance when you're querying multiple columns of a single row, as OLTP applications typically do. To facilitate locating the single row you're looking for, in a row-oriented database, you will typically create indexes on high cardinality columns, such as unique keys or nearly unique co columns. So when Elmer Fudd calls your customer service center, he might have his account number, which lets you go directly to his record, or his phone number, which might or might not be unique, but at least narrows down your results to the few accounts that share that phone number. However, indexes are usually not helpful in analytical queries which scan many rows. For example, if you want to answer the question, what is the average age of our male customers? Even if you have an index on sex, it won't be used when the query will return about 50% of the rows, or generally speaking, any time your query will return more than 10% of the data. Usually a query of this type will result in a sequential scan, which is a performance killer. Imagine if you had hundreds of millions of rows and hundreds of columns. If your table is 100 gigabytes, you're going to end up reading the entire 100 gigabytes. If it's 10 terabytes, you read 10 terabytes. Your only other option is to build a composite index on age and sex so that you can do an index scan where all the results you need are in the index. But in an analytical environment, you can't usually predict every combination of attributes and filters that you're going to want to query. So you would have to build huge composite indexes on everything in order to cover all the possible combinations. So how does a columnar database work? In a columnar database, each column is stored in a separate file. So one file contains only the key column, another file contains only the first name column, another contains the state, and so on. Each column in a given row is at the same offset in its respective file, a mechanism sometimes referred to as auto-indexing, because any column can be used almost like an index. That is, when you scan a column and you find the value you want, the offset of that column will correspond to the offsets of the other columns in that row in their respective files. Because each column is stored in its own file, 
you only have to read the files you need, and you can skip all the columns that are not in your query. This also results in improved compression because all the data in a single file is of the same data type. Now let's go back to the table with the 100 million rows and the 100 columns. You still have 100 million rows, but you only have to read two columns, not 100, to find the average age of your male customers. So we can see how columnar databases produce automatic vertical partitioning by allowing you to read only the columns you need. InfiniDB also automatically provides horizontal partitioning by storing 8 million rows by default in an extent and creating an extent map which shows what the maximum and minimum values of the column are in each extent. InfiniDB reads this extent map and can avoid reading any extent that doesn't contain the values you're searching for. So if you have a column that is commonly used in filters, it can hugely improve your performance if your data is sorted by that column because then you minimize the number of extents that contain the values you're searching for. Dates are often used for this purpose, both because incremental loads will usually have later dates, so incremental loads result in automatic date sorting, and also because the most recent data is usually more frequently accessed. So you may be storing 10 years of data, but if your queries are often limited to the most recent six months, Horizontal partitioning will automatically eliminate the extents containing the older data from your query and reduce your I.O. An added bonus to columnar storage is that it is much easier to add a new column to a table. In active data warehousing systems, deriving new attributes is very common. Those 200 column tables didn't usually start out with 200 columns. In row-oriented databases, where the entire row is generally stored together and rows are stored sequentially, adding a column usually requires shifting all the data on the page and therefore rebuilding the entire table. If the table is 100 gigabytes, this can take a very long time. But in a columnar database, it just has to create a new file when you add a column. So what are some of the limitations of a columnar database? You can see that it is clearly unsuitable for OLTP type transactions where you will typically access a single row which can be identified via a unique key. An index will always make this type of access much faster on a row oriented database. Columnar databases are specifically intended for analytical applications. Don't try to do OLTP on a columnar database. Any type of single row data manipulation may present challenges. When you are inserting just a single row of data in a row-oriented database, it just adds the entire row to the end of the last page. But in a columnar database, each column of the new row has to be appended to its respective file. The more columns are in the table, the larger the performance difference would be, if you did it that way, but you won't. Instead, inserts should be batched and loaded with CP import the InfiniDB bulk loader, which makes inserting a lot of data very fast. Similarly, deleting a single row in a row-oriented database is a relatively simple matter of deleting the row on the page where it is located, unless you've had to create hundreds of indexes, as we've discussed earlier, in order to facilitate your analytical queries, in which case you'll be waiting a long time while all the indexes are updated. Deleting a row in a columnar database, meanwhile, requires deleting a record in each of the column files. Again, it's best to batch your deletions. If your data was sorted, for example, by date, and you are deleting older data, then any extents that contain only data that is to be deleted can be dropped, which is significantly faster than deleting all the rows in the extent. If this is not an option, consider copying the rows you wish to keep into a new table using your new friend CP import and dropping the old table. For updates, in either a row-oriented or column-oriented database, if the new data is the same size as the old data, the existing value is simply replaced. 
If the new data is larger than the old data, for example, updating a short var car string with a longer one, then a row-oriented database will require rewriting the remaining rows on the page and possibly even moving one or more rows to another page. So it's actually possible for the column-oriented database to outperform a row-oriented database in this case. However, remember that in a large table, you still have the overhead of locating the row to be updated. So batching up your operations is still a good idea. Now, a quick overview of the architecture of InfiniDB. There are two main components of the InfiniDB system. A user module, which is responsible for processing the query it receives from the MySQL front-end and breaking it into small, discrete tasks. And the performance module, which is responsible for performing these tasks. Scaling up the number of user modules, therefore, improves concurrent operations, but will not improve the speed of a single query, which can be sped up by increasing the number of performance modules. In version 2.2, the performance modules use a shared storage system, so any performance modules can access any piece of data. InfiniDB can also run on a single server, with both user module and performance module running on the same machine. In the latest release, version 3.0, there is also a shared nothing option in which each performance module has its own storage which is not shared with the other performance modules. In every query, each performance module is responsible for retrieving the data from its own storage system. So what do you need to know to make this all work for you? InfiniDB uses the MySQL front end, so standard MySQL syntax is used for most commands, such as create table, select, insert, etc. There are exceptions. For example, Cartesian products are not supported and nor are triggers. Hopefully you've seen how easy InfiniDB is to use because everything is automatic. Automatic vertical partitioning eliminates unneeded columns at query time. Automatic horizontal partitioning eliminates unneeded extents at query time. Having only one data type in a file improves compression ratios. And auto-indexing means you don't have to think about what indexes to build. And you already know how to use it because it uses standard SQL and the MySQL front end. Lastly, here are some useful links. The CalPont website contains a ton of useful information, white papers, data sheets, case studies, and much more. A link to download a 30-day trial version and the URL of the Open Source Community Edition. Thank you for listening, and I hope you've taken some of mystery out of the columnar databases.